Okay, hello. Welcome, everyone, to the Slumber Party Podcast. I'm Amanda Jusen. I am here today with Beth- Bethany Saltman. I've done this every time. I, I want to say Bethany, which isn't even a name. But <laughs> Bethany Saltman, um, who wrote Strange Situation, a book that I uh, became aware of a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh, I feel like this is right up my alley. And then uh, I opened it and then that's all I did. Like I ignored my family for the weekend. So wow. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Um, but I was dying. I'm dying to have you on um, as a sleep uh, person, as someone who helps people sleep independently. Um, often many of my clients struggle with that part. Um, and what is often the, the, the pull between I, I'm not, I can't do this. I can't do the like co-sleeping thing that I've been told is like wonderful and revolutionary and this great thing for me and my baby. I'm, I'm not really doing it well. Um, but also, uh, like, uh, I'm afraid of the damage that I'll do to our attachment, right? And and this idea of attachment. And so a lot of the work that I do with my clients is actually breaking down attachment theory. Um, And you do such a beautiful job in this book, both weaving your personal story that I resonated very personally with and actual attachment theory. Um, And so I would love for you to kind of just jump in and give us a little sample of your journey and why you decided to write this very important book. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure to be here and talking to you and all of the moms and dads out there who are struggling um, with sleep, but also just with being parents and, and, you know, finding, that a challenging journey. And it's wonderful that they have people like you to be, you know, giving them resources and support. So that's really wonderful. When my daughter Azalea was born 15 years ago, I'm sure there were things like that, but well, I wasn't on Instagram until last year um, (laughs) when the pandemic. So I don't know what Instagram was doing. I don't think it was even a thing. I don't Um, think so either. No, but um, yeah, so it's it's wonderful that parents have so many resources now, and I'm and I'm happy to be a part of that. I'm I'm honored, in fact. So yeah, I mean, gosh, you know, my my journey began. I mean, where does anything begin? But we'll say <laughs> when my daughter Azalea was born 15 years ago, and. Um, I had been practicing Buddhism for many years and was, you know, had been in therapy and and was a writer, a poet, a feminist, et cetera, all the things, and really considered uh, myself a pretty mindful person. Um, and, and I, and I think that I thought that when I became a mother, I would become um, a mindful person who was also incredibly patient and tolerant and some <laughs> other than and, and I really thought right. that like this maternal um, magic would happen and I would not, you know, sometimes I hear people talk about feeling like they, they're supposed to know what to do. And it wasn't so much that. It was more like I didn't know how to be. I didn't mm-hmm. know how, I mean, I loved my daughter. Um, there was, you know, luckily there, there wasn't a, an issue there or with so-called bonding or anything like that. But I, um, I just didn't know like what to do with her and I didn't know how to <laughs> be in that relationship and I found it really, um, difficult and yeah. very, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of the fact that she's in the house. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. I found it really, yeah. um, challenging to, to, to my sense of self and who I was and what I like to do and how I like to spend my time. And then I felt frustrated and irritable and angry a lot. Resentful. Did you have an understanding of attachment theory before you had Azalea? No, okay. No, I, mean, I, I, had... I, no, you go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Just that. No, I had absolutely no, nothing. <laughs> well, in, I, I really distinctly my, remember my introduction to attachment parenting specifically. Um, Which I really the beginning is not attachment science. 
Exactly. Attachment parenting is a style of parenting. Um, and I, uh, I just, I remember being a new parent. Um, I had gone to all natural, uh, birthing classes and because I, I wanted a medic, uh, medication free birth. And I've said this on this podcast a million times. It's not for any reason other than I'm really scared of needles. Like I'm going to get this vaccine, but I'm afraid of the needle part <laughs> still. And I didn't yeah. want an yeah. epidural. Uh, truly, that's it. The end. Um, yeah. And so I went to a natural birth class, which uh, the instructor was lovely and then said, okay, all of you parents here, I invite you to my mom's group after. And I was like, what a great idea. I remember showing up. This is just so hilarious in my mind now as a more experienced parent, but I show up, I have Winnie, who's my daughter in her car seat. I take her out. I like set out this little, little play mat in front of her. She's maybe like a month old and I'm like holding her and then I fed her and then I put her down and she's like, la, 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 la. And I remember, I'll never forget it. I'm in the class and I think, wow, look at me. She's down there. She's so happy. And I am like champion mom right now. Like she's so great. She feels totally comfortable, not on me. I'm then realizing through the conversation as we're going around that everyone is like, I remember this mom being like, I'm really struggling with the idea that my child has to be on me all day and I can't have a shower. And I remember being like, who said that they have to be on you? Like, I didn't know that. And then I realized what was happening, that these parents were subscribing to this style of parenting. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even know that this was the thing. I stopped going to the class because I felt like, to be fair, it, it didn't isolate me, but I was doing OK mentally. And I felt like a number of the parents weren't. And I felt like a bit of an asshole coming on and being like, I'm doing great. Look at this little child. <laughs> so I just stopped going. Right, right, right. Yeah. But that can be, I, re, I did remember leaving being like, huh, I'm not doing that. And and there was a less than moment. Yeah. I mean, you're not doing the, that attachment parenting thing that you were just being introduced to in that moment. Yeah. I had no idea. And then I started to wonder, oh, is this something I should be doing? And the more I looked into it, I was like, I, I know that I can't do that. So I'm just, she's going to have to deal with things now and things are going well. And so I didn't really put much thought into it until, yeah. you know, later on when you start to learn about, you know, these attachments and, um, um, you know, potentially all of these harmful ongoing side effects of not having this great attachment with your child. Um, and having had my own personal trauma history, it did become something that I worried about frequently. And you, you go on that journey in your book as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and so when Azalea was born, I I mean, I guess it was just before she was born, I started to hear about Dr. Sears and attachment parenting and and I thought it seemed pretty cool because I am someone who I am allergic to gear. I hate um having any like stuff around, so you know, the idea of wearing my child and nursing and uh, co-sleeping, all of that seemed great because it would just be less stuff in the house. Mm -hmm. Um so it turned out that, you know, I loved wearing a zillion sling. I wore a sling to her in, in an ergo, like a care until she was like six, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I just couldn't carry her anymore. And co-sleeping did not work for us, any of us. Breastfeeding did. I loved that. But the the premise upon which Sears is talking about um, is just incorrect, you know, and I would learn that later that that what he's talking about, like you said, these are all styles that have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not a child is securely attached. And he's taking science and hijacking it in order to make people think that his style is the the one and only way. And he has mm -hmm. his own agendas for that. And mm -hmm. he has his reasons. And um, it's pretty uncool, in my opinion. And he's mm -hmm. kind of falling out of favor, I think. So that's that's good. But but the idea <laughs> of of you know this this fear around attachment is very much alive and with us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and my journey was very much about worrying that Azalea was not going to be securely attached because I figured, because I, I had learned, you know, just enough to be dangerous, you know, that expression. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the um, Dan Siegel book, Parenting from the Inside Out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, you know, what's going on inside of you is being passed down to your child. Mm-hmm. I'm terrified by that because I knew what I had been through and I didn't want my child who I loved so much to, to have to suffer the way I had. And I just assumed that my suffering was due to an insecure attachment. Mm-hmm. Because I figured, well, I had all these issues with relationships. I was a, you know, like a love addict and, and more, and, you know, it was a delinquent teen um, you know, all these things that seemed on the surface to describe an insecure attachment. Well, it turns mm-hmm. out that's not true. Mm-hmm. And, that, you know, after this big, long journey that I went on and did all these trainings and got the, the, some of the, some of the things, um, the evaluations done on me. And so I learned that I actually am a securely attached adult, which was the biggest mind blower of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's, but that's not the end of the story. That's the middle of the story. The end of the story is me having a better understanding of what attachment actually means. And what it means is valuing attachment and mm-hmm. valuing connection and valuing relationship. It doesn't mean you never get into trouble. It doesn't mean you don't suffer. It doesn't mean you don't screw up. It doesn't mean that you're not human. Mm-hmm. It means that you have feelings and that you can deal with your feelings and you can move within your feelings. And this is a radical shift from the way we are conditioned to A, think of ourselves as human beings, particularly women, mm-hmm. and B, to think about attachment. You know, everybody is so caught up in fear as I was. You know, this isn't a judgment. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Like, <gasps> secure or not secure, as though it's like this precipice you're going to fall into and can never get out. And, yeah. you know, women are so, we are just, you know, fed shame day in, day out. Um, as a way to keep us in line. And this mm-hmm. is another way that the patriarchy is keeping women away from their power. Oh my God, you're hitting all of the notes for me right now. Okay, so yes, I always call, like my biggest criticism of, a, I, I'm going to lose like followers for this, but my biggest criticism of attachment parenting is that it's attachment mothering. It's not attachment parenting. It, these are often um, responsibilities that yeah. are left to the mother to do co-sleep, body wear. You know, it's just like all yeah. literally, we are asking so much of a woman's physical body, which has never been how we raise children. It's never been in isolation with the responsibility being on one woman. It's just, it's in, it's insane. Literally literally on one woman. Like you just can't do that. And especially in our modern life. And you know what, what a lot of people will send me, um, no, go, go, Sorry, there's go. A there's a, a slight delay. In our, in our yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to also, because what you're saying is so true and so important. It's not attachment parenting, it's attaching, attachment mothering, but it's also not attachment mothering. It's clinging mothering. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and yes. You know, from a Buddhist point of view, we talk about attachment as um, what happens when we cling. Um, and attachment is what happens when we aren't aware, when we're not in, in the groove of the, um, impermanence of all things, Mm -hmm. everything that arises falls. And this is true of every single thing, you know, in our lives. And we get into trouble. We suffer from a Buddhist perspective when we cling and when we try to keep things static and Mm -hmm. that is so, so, you know, from a psychological point of view, a secure attachment is a healthy thing from a Buddhist point of view. Attachment is the thing is the source of our suffering. So mm. when I hear attachment parenting or attachment mothering, as you've put it, I think, yeah, it's actually clinging, mm-hmm. clinging it, to a, a certain state of mind and, and trying to create um, an experience as opposed to it, just, you know, relax. It, and, you know, this is all all not to say, and I think you would agree, and, and, you know, from what I read in your book and on your own Instagram, I think we do agree, is that... It's not to say that attachment parenting styles are wrong if that is what you really are excited about doing. 
and, and it brings out the best in you. And it's like, oh, I love doing this. I love co-sleeping. Like, oh my gosh, have at her. I, I really think that we need to be encouraging a, a parenting style where you are it feels like a breath of fresh air, whatever it is. It feels like you're living your truth. And, yes. And and your kids will feel that, you know, just like I can't say everyone should sleep train. Everyone should absolutely not sleep train. Absolutely not. Um, but there are a way, there are ways to do it. And uh, what I really loved, so I love that you talk about Dan Siegel because Dan Siegel wrote the foreword in your book as well. And that's like, like no big deal. Good job on that. <laughs> yeah. I, I like uh, in all of my sleep work, do you know, I have like, what would Dan Siegel do in my head at all times? And one day I will write a book and if he oh. does my foreword, I will feel very accomplished in my life. So I think, yeah, yeah. you know, well, I promised you what he would do to say that he would be supportive of you as a mom. That's what he does. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. He, he is amazing. And I, I always refer to his work in my work as well for that reason. Um, uh, yeah. In, in, and I, I felt like one of the things that you come to at the end as well is that um, that I didn't know or understand is that attachment is like something that's evolving and that you can change. Maybe change is not the right word, but as you heal, you can attach to different people, caregivers, which I think is actually, you know, I don't know. You have some pretty cool things. So um, you kind of glossed over this a little bit, but in your book, you kind of get in with like the scientists doing the top notch research on this. And you're like, yeah. hi, uh, I, I want in. I want in. Tell me what you're doing. And they're just so open to you, which is amazing and and fully underscores the message. Like if you want something, just ask. And so you get to do all of these experiments. You get all of this knowledge that nobody else gets. And as a result of this, you get to know things that many people don't know about their themselves, including what was your attachment like as a child? There's a whole process to figure this out. I did get to the end of the book and, you know, I went from, I don't think I had a secure attachment with my mother, but I did have a secure attachment with my grandmother. And that actually, I think was really healthy and kept me going. Um, it, so yeah, I mean, you jump in. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, you're right. I, I love that you brought that out because one of the big messages of my book is if you want something, ask and then never give up. I mean, because I asked and asked and asked and asked and asked and asked, um, you know, <laughs> total nudge. And, um, you know, so yes, there's all the attachment stuff and there's the book writing stuff, and but there's also just, you know, and one of the qualities of having a secure attachment is this grit. And, um, you know, but we can reverse engineer these things. And this is what I talk to people about all the time when they're writing their books and it's just like in life that um, it goes both ways. So if, if a secure attachment is what you're after and a secure attachment, someone who has a secure attachment tends to be more uh, more able to be in the present, more able to tell a coherent story, more able to observe and and you know um, correctly report upon what they're seeing in their environment, and more able to have connected relationships with others. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a attachment if a secure attachment is what you're after, you can reverse engineer it and just start trying to do all those things. <laughs> huh. um, take a writing class. Um, Get into therapy, um, mm -hmm. really prioritize your relationships, um, start to notice how you're a workaholic and perhaps you're trying to get your, your needs met through external means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all these ways that we are avoiding um, the pain of not having our needs met. Um, yeah. The, you know, when we do this over a lifetime, it creates a certain kind of karmic experience and we just repeat, repeat, repeat. So yes, we can absolutely change our orientation in our attachment through our present day work. This is <sighs> utterly true. And we can all start right now 
And, and, <sighs> and one of the main ways that this is, that we do this is through valuing attachment. It's like this crazy, you know, cycle. A, um, mm-hmm. And so valuing our relationships, spending time with the people that we love, working on our relationships. Um, you know, th- these are, these are the things that create and maintain a secure attachment throughout generations, in fact. I love that so much. And I, I feel like that's such an important and empowering message for, that's for empowering. mothers. That, exactly. I, you know, I, I think about my own personal journey. I, I also thought, in all fairness, my daughter came out and I was a way better parent than I thought I was going to be to an infant. I've always said, like, I want children. I want children six plus. I And I didn't know how I was going to do with the baby stage. And I loved it. Breastfeeding came easily. Um, but then she became a toddler. And I actually really struggled with that um, the opposition mm. of her. And then I wasn't dealing with that well. And then that's where my fears and everything came out. I mean, I had a whole ton of things yeah. that I need to un- unpack in therapy. One of the most like aha over the head moments for me is I'm sitting in therapy and my therapist asked me, what do you think your children think or feel when you are anxious. And I said in, in a hundred percent certainty, I said, no, they don't know I'm anxious. I don't talk about it in front of them. And she said, no, they absolutely Uh. know that you are anxious. Your children feel you. And one of the lines that she said, when you are well, Amanda, your children are well. And that was just, if that's not the wake up call that you need to like, be like, okay, I have to do things for me that feel really good. So my children feel really good. That means sleep. That means not baby wearing, or it can mean co-sleeping. It can mean baby wearing. Exactly. It's like, you need to do that. You just need to be honoring thyself to honor thy children. (laughs) Right. But we are so conditioned to think that that's being selfish. It's just the craziest upside down nut burger thing. Well, we know that's a patriarchy at work. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, we sure do know that. And, um, and I say this to moms, you know, every single day, if you can't take care of yourself for yourself, do it for your kids. Yep. Yeah. You know, because no women have such a hard time doing it for themselves. I, I'm it, yes. You brought me back to a point where I was like, "Oh crap, I forgot it." And now it's back. We have to be. I have questions about people who create these parenting books and these these mothering guides written by men. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to see. I'm going to get myself into trouble. Uh, there is a, a breastfeeding person here in Canada that is very well renowned, who I've heard not wonderful stories about and is very, 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 very breastfeeding forward. I know mothers who, especially my clients, who are literally like killing themselves to make this happen. They're not sleeping. They're up 10 times a night pumping. They are. And it's just like nonstop. Like I, I breastfed both of my girls. I love breastfeeding. You can also breastfeed and sleep train. I'm very breastfeeding friendly. But when it comes to the point where you are are doing crazy things to make that happen, who are we doing that for? Who who are we doing that for? Is it and then again it goes back to women's bodies. Who has control over that? Who's running the narrative about women's bodies? Absolutely. Absolutely. <sighs> Yeah, no, it's really, it is like the final frontier of mm-hmm. um, patriarchal conditioning because it mm-hmm. is so deep inside of us. Mm-hmm. And look, I'm all for nursing and breastfeeding and I'm all mm-hmm. for, I mean, all of it, you know, but mm-hmm. the reason why I call it clinging parenting, not attachment parenting is because of exactly what you're talking about. It becomes mm-hmm. life or death identity. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that is the source of our suffering. We are clinging to something that is no longer effective or mm-hmm. relevant or important. You know, like mm-hmm. this is not life or death for babies. It's not. No. 
No. And nor is it an indication of a secure or insecure attachment. It is not. And Alan Struff, one of the kings of this whole world, has said that, um, you know, it's better to bottle feed a, an infant with love in your eyes. I mean, this isn't a direct quote. Then mm-hmm. be, you know, frustratingly trying to stick your breast in your baby's mouth. Uh, absolutely. I, and I love that. And I, that's a really powerful statement. And, you know, there's definitely going to be a mom listening to this in that moment. Um, it is worth, I mean, I, I refer to one lactation consultant only who calls herself a, a feeding consultant because she helps people feed their babies, whether right. through boobs yeah. or bottles. And yeah. I'm like, yes, that's what we need. That's yeah. exactly what we need. Okay. I feel like we could talk about this forever. I always say that this podcast, I like to keep it to the length of a crap nap, which is about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, (laughs) So you can like get through it while you're like doing something in your house. The book is a strange situation. Now it just came out in paperback in the US. I don't know if it's out in uh, paperback yet. It's coming out at the end of April in paperback, but you can okay. buy the cover. And you know, I realize we haven't really talked about sleep at all. So we should do, the, we should do another one of these to talk about sleep. I would love to. Well, and you, you have a whole uh, section in your book. It's short, but you do talk about your own experience with sleep. Um, I, I don't think you're very prescriptive on purpose. Um, and, yeah. and, but that's, but I also think like, we need to see, I like to see your journey through that. So I don't want to ruin it for yeah. people either. I want people to go and read this book. Um, I found it very healing. So thank you. And uh, I I hope that everyone who reads it feels the same. And I'm also, ha- my goal was not to cry in this podcast and I didn't. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love crying. Crying is good. <laughs> I love crying too, but I'm an ugly crier and this is on film. But I, when I, <laughs> when I, um, so I, li- I love listening to books. I do an hour long walk every morning, especially from the pandemic. So I listened to oh. your book oh. and I was like, walking down, I live in Stratford, Ontario, walking uh, down the river, crying, being like, oh, and, and I was even doing this. Oh my so God. like people thought I was losing my mind that impactful. So good. I can't recommend the book enough. Oh. Um, where can people find out more about you? Um, I have a website, Bethany and I am on Instagram. So the, the pandemic got me on the gram and that's Bethany underscore Saltman. And I'm having a ball there actually. And we Yay. People like you, so, um, yeah, so those are the two places. And I actually, I run a, I, I offer a free study group um, the second Tuesday of every month on Mary Ainsworth's Secret Teachings, um, where we talk about her really hardcore, deep attachment work that nobody ever talks about. And oh. it's for an hour and a half, and it's from 2 to 3.30 Eastern. It's incredible. The people who are on there are therapists and moms and researchers and experts. And it's, and, and we just nerd out. And we talk a lot about, a lot about sensitivity, not just to your baby, but to yourself. Oh, I, I think I'm going to join this. So that's you for me. Really, going. really. I would love for you to be there. You will love it. It's um, just so fun. There was something, oh yeah, I was going to say spoiler alert. Mary Ainsworth has a Canadian history. Ah, she's Canadian. I, I I was so I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a little shout out. And did you write in yes, your book okay. that your mother is Canadian? Did I imagine that? Correct. Correct. Yes, my mother is Canadian. She's from a little town in Ontario, um, um, Oliphant. Oh, I don't even know Tiny. where that is. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. It's Wyerton. She's from Wyerton. And oh, then she Wyerton. Her, her mom had a cottage in Oliphant. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So Mary Ainsworth actually was born in the United States, but she moved to Toronto when she was young and went to the University of Toronto. And um, yeah. So she was very Canadian ish. Oh, yeah. No, that. Canadian- like, can- oh. Canadians just can't help themselves either. It'd be like, oh, I heard your mother's best friend's daughter's dog is Canadian. We'd be like, yeah, it is. It's true. Look at us. 
he's an amazing attachment researcher and he's Canadian. Oh, look at us. We're just sitting over here, just giving it. <laughs> we really are. And so polite on top of <laughs> Thank you. Well, it was a pleasure. Uh, as yeah. always, folks, you can find me at babiesbestsleep.com on Instagram at babiesbestsleep. Please share your thoughts on this episode on uh, YouTube. Go ahead and write a review on iTunes. Uh, but most importantly, get a good night's sleep. Have a good one, everyone. See you later. Bye.